Millsville Institute at the University of Copenhagen. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, talk to you all today about my research. Um, and I just want to, uh, as uh, Sophia did, or you know, <laughs> just take a moment to thank uh, Laure the L'Oreal Foundation and um, um, UNESCO and the Danish Royal Academy for the award and for giving us the opportunity to present our work here. Um, so this evening, I want to take you on a journey um, 13 billion years back in time um, and tell you about what we've been learning about how the very first stars and galaxies form in our universe um, and how this period is really having a revolution right now um, because of this uh, giant uh, telescope that we've launched into space um, last Christmas, the James Webb Space Telescope, that is enabling us to observe the first galaxies in the universe for the first time. Um, so how do we do this? Um, and I'm going to tell you now, and this is the thing that I really want you to take away from this talk, um, that we are all time travelers in a way, um, because we can all look back in time. We can look back into the past directly um, when we look into space. Um, and that's because light has a speed limit. Um, the speed limit of light was actually um, first discovered by a Danish astronomer, uh, Ola Rumer, in the seven, uh, 1600s. Um, and the speed limit of light is very, very, very large. Um, it's about a billion kilometers per hour. But space is really, really big. So that means it takes light time to travel through space. Um, and so let's think about the closest light source to us, so the sun. Uh, does anyone here know how long it takes light to travel from the sun to Earth? Eight minutes. OK, great. Uh, yes, so it takes light eight minutes to travel from the sun to Earth. So when you look at the sun, I mean, don't actually look at the sun uh, because you might go blind. Um, but when you get the light from the sun, you're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. So you're looking back in time eight minutes. So as we go further and further out, the further back in time we can see, so if we look into the, the stars that we see in our night sky, so these are stars within our Milky Way galaxy, um, we're looking back in time on the scale of years. So four to around 30,000 years back in time is how far we're looking when we look at the stars in the night sky. Um, as we keep going further out, we'll go out to the next picture that I'm showing you here, which is the Andromeda galaxy, which is our nearest gala uh, ga galactic neighbor. Um, it's quite similar, actually, we think, to the Milky Way, our home. Uh, it takes light two million years to travel from Andromeda to our eyes. Um, and so uh, this is our closest neighbor. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking at Andromeda, you're seeing it as it was two million years ago. And that's, you know, basically when there were like saber toothed tigers walking around on Earth. So it's a long, long time ago. Um, this tiny little red dot that you're seeing in this very last image is the most distant galaxy that has yet been detected. Um, this was detected and confirmed by um, observations with this new James Webb Space Telescope at the end of last year. Um, and this galaxy, it has taken light 13.6 uh, billion years to reach us. Um, so that Tiny little galaxy sent out its light 13.6 billion years ago, and it's only just reached our telescopes. And so in this way, as uh, astronomers and astrophysicists, we kind of act a bit like archaeologists. So we basically look for galaxies further and further away, so we can look further and further back in time and try to piece together the history of our universe. And that's sort of what my job gets to be, which is really cool, I think. <laughs> um, and so one of the biggest questions that I try to ask in my research is, when and how did the very first galaxies form? Um, and so here I'm showing you just a kind of cartoon um, artist impression of the history of our universe, um, which we think started with um, the Big Bang, and then a period of very rapid inflation, and then a more gradual period of expansion. Um, and gradually, the first stars and galaxies form producing the modern universe that we have today on the right, and planets and life, et cetera. Um, but until now, we've really had a missing chapter in our understanding of this history of the universe, um, which is this period that we call cosmic dawn, the period when the very first stars and galaxies formed. Um, um, but we are 
getting to the point now where we can start to directly observe this period, and I'll explain that um, during this talk. Um, so the universe, we think, is about 13.8 uh, billion years old. Um, I said there's a lot of very big numbers in this talk, so I'm going to try and <laughs> condense things down a little bit. So I'm going to try and put this on a human time scale. Um, so let's think about the universe as the age of a 30-year-old. Um, and so for context, Earth formed about 4.5 billion years ago. Um, so that would be when you were a university student. Um, and we do actually have a baby photo of the universe. Um, this is an image called the Cosmic Microwave Background, which I don't have very much time to talk about today, which could be a, a whole talk in itself. Um, but this is really the afterglow of the Big Bang um, that we see um, about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. The universe has cooled down enough that atoms can form. Um, before that point, basically, all of the particles in the universe were bouncing off each other so much that light couldn't travel through the universe. And once the universe has cooled down and expanded, atoms form, and light can finally travel through the universe. And that is what we see when we see the cosmic microwave background. Um, but after that period, the universe is actually a pretty boring place. It's a pretty dark place. Uh, there's nothing really going on um, until the very first stars and galaxies form. Um, and as I was saying, this is a period that we just haven't had any information about before. What we think is happening, um, and I'm going to show you now this um, simula computer simulation, which hopefully you will be able to see, is that gradually over time, very small um, fluctuations in density um, that are in the universe after the Big Bang start to pull together under gravity, getting denser and denser and denser, drawing in more and more gas. And eventually, um, you'll start to see these regions getting brighter. Um, and that's when the, the regions are dense enough that the first stars can form. Um, and these basically, this is a sort of skeleton um, universe where the stars and gal the, the, uh, galaxies form in the, the nodes of the skeleton, in the densest parts. And so this is a simulation. This is a computer simulation where we put in the laws of gravity, and we put in gas, and we put in a substance called dark matter, which we think makes up um, the majority of mass in our universe. Um, but we don't really know if this is right. <laughs> um, and so a big goal is to go and observe further and further back in time and try to, and, you know, try to observe the universe as it was in what we think is the early stages of the simulation to test how well we understand how everything in our universe came to be. Um, but it turns out this is actually, you know, it's very challenging to observe the very, very distant universe, and I'll talk about that a bit more, um, for both an observational reason, but also because it turns out the early universe was very foggy. Um, so after the Big Bang, um, I said atoms form. Those atoms, which are mostly hydrogen atoms, turn out that they're, they're actually, they tend to block most of the starlight. So even when stars are forming, it's going to be very, it's very difficult, it will be very difficult for us to see a lot of that starlight um, because it's blocked by this hydrogen fog. Um, and so a large part of my research is actually trying to figure out um, what is going on in this fog um, because we think, we know today that the universe doesn't have this hydrogen fog. Um, we can see things in the universe. And so we think that the very first galaxies um, actually, much like how the... Um, you know, sunlight on a foggy day might eventually um, burn away the, the, you know, the fog on a foggy day. The starlight from these very first stars in the first galaxies will burn away this hydrogen fog. And so again here, oh, the movie didn't work. Did, the movie, did you see the movie? No. Oh, here. Okay. So this is a, a simulation, again, um, showing you this process of this fog being burnt away, and this is a process that we call reionization, um, where the, the light from the very first uh, stars burns away, so heats and ionizes that hydrogen fog. Um, and so what you see happening is these bubbles forming um, in the gas in the early universe, so these bubbles forming around the first galaxies until eventually the entire universe becomes cleared of this fog. Um, and so a big part of my research is trying to figure out exactly how this process happened, um, you know, when and, and how this happened. And so we've been able to start to place constraints on when this happened. Um, and so we think now that this process was complete about one billion years after the Big Bang. 
Um, and so it was really likely caused by the very first stars and galaxies. And I, I like to make this analogy that reionization is kind of like baking a, a loaf of uh, sourdough bread, which has all these bubbles in it. Um, because the, you know, the structure of the bread, how many bubbles you're going to have, is really determined by the ingredients that you put in and the recipe that you use. So if we can figure out what this loaf of bread looks like, if we can measure this process of reionization, we can learn something about those ingredients, which were the very, very first galaxies. Because I think even with JWST, these first galaxies are so far away from us, they're so incredibly faint, that we may not be able to detect the first galaxy directly. Um, but by understanding how this reionization process happened, which was uh, driven by all of these galaxies and all of their light, um, we can learn about the properties of the first galaxies. So how do we actually do this in practice? Um, we want to observe these galaxies. Uh, so we can use the fact that these galaxies are made of billions of stars. So I'm zooming in here on the Andromeda galaxy, and you can see just in one section, there's billions of stars in there. And then we can basically use a really fancy prism um, to take something that we call a spectrum of the galaxy. So breaking up the light from that galaxy into its different components, um, and the spectrum is built up of the light from all of the stars inside that galaxy. And so typically, the galaxies that we're looking for in the very early universe are very young galaxies. And young galaxies emit most of their light um, well, they hit, and most of their light comes from very young stars. And young stars emit most of their light in the ultraviolet wavelength range. Um, and so what you're seeing here is the sort of typical spectrum of a fairly young galaxy. So a big peak on the left in the ultraviolet coming from these young hot stars. Um, and then the more regular stars that emit most of their light in blue and green wavelengths. So this is the signature really that we're looking for when we look for very young, early universe galaxies. Um, but um, the universe, um, again, this could be a whole other talk, the universe is expanding. Um, and so that means that light coming from these very distant galaxies in the, in the distant universe um, gets stretched as it travels through space. Um, and so this light that was emitted in the ultraviolet gets shifted to redder wavelengths. And this is what we call a redshift. Um, and so I'll show you what that looks like in this, you know, this cartoon spectrum. So the light from this young galaxy that was emitted originally in the ultraviolet, by the time it reaches our telescopes, it's been red shifted all the way to infrared wavelengths. And so when we want to observe these very, very distant galaxies in the early universe, we need to use infrared telescopes um, to detect these galaxies. Um, and, well, I should say at the moment, um, before the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, most of our, our telescopes worked just at the edge of the infrared, so in the near infrared, so um, up to about two microns. Um, and to detect um, these very, very distant galaxies requires using the largest telescopes that we have um, on Earth and in space. Um, and in astronomy, bigger definitely is better. Um, and you really want a very, very big telescope to detect light from these very distant galaxies. And so to think about that, um, if you imagine you're in a dark room, you, your pupil will dilate to let more light in. Um, and so in just the same way, that's why we need really big telescopes. Telescopes are essentially just buckets for light. We want to collect as much light as possible. Um, and then we can focus that and put it into an instrument to measure things. So here I'm just showing you some examples of these largest telescopes which I've used for my research. So the Keck telescopes in Hawaii, um, the very uh, originally named Very Large Telescope uh, in Chile, um, and the Hubble Space Telescope. And I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the Hubble Space Telescope before I talk about the James Webb Space Telescope, because um, Hubble is amazing and has been amazing for the last you know, more than 30 years now. I think it's now 33. So this is uh, the deepest image ever taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, this is an image called the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. Um, and it was taken over a period of over 10 days, or actually, I think, over 20 days to get this, uh, this image. Um, it's a, the, they decided to point the telescope at a pretty boring patch of sky and just see you know, what would we detect. It's a tiny patch of sky. It's about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. 
And basically everything that you see in that image is another galaxy filled with billions of stars. Start that sinking a little bit. So I still get my mind blown when I look at these things, <laughs> when I think about that. Um, and, you know, this, yeah, this, this tiny kind of grain of sand um, is this part of the, we've been able to observe this part of the universe in incredible detail. We've also observed, you know, larger areas of the sky. Um, and with these, with images like this, we can um, do this process of archaeology, like I was talking about, we can look in this image and try to find these very, very distant galaxies. So I guess we were saying we were looking for these infrared galaxies. Um, so all the tiny little red dots, if you can spot tiny little red dots, those are going to be the, the most distant galaxies. Um, and so one of the, the kind of major things that we've learned through these um, big galaxy surveys with the Hubble Space Telescope is that, um, which has really kind of informed that simulation that I showed you right at the beginning, is that we think that galaxies form um, and evolve in a, what we call a hierarchical fashion. So basically from smaller to bigger. So here I'm showing you um, the, the number of uh, galaxies um, in any of the, in the universe, I guess, in these surveys, as a function of the total mass of all of the stars in those galaxies, or, or just the brightness. So a brighter galaxy will have more stars. And so here on the right, you've got very bright, massive galaxies on the left. Uh, low mass faint galaxies. Um, and the picture that, that has emerged from all of these observations is that generally there are lots and lots of very faint things, so at the top left there, um, and not very many bright things, not very many bright massive galaxies. And as you look further into the past, um, this shifts, the population shifts, so we've got more and more faint galaxies, faint small galaxies in the early universe, and fewer and fewer of these massive galaxies. And so we think this is telling us that galaxies basically grow over time by a combination of merging with each other, merging together and gobbling each other up, um, but also from a kind of steady growth where they're pulling in more um, fresh gas um, from the surroundings around them um, and they can grow um, more stars over time. But the galaxy population is growing um, over time. But um, we don't know like what happened in the early universe, as I said. We're really missing um, this, this piece, which is when the very first galaxies formed. So did they you know, also start in this process of they're really, really small and they suddenly they gobbling each other up, or did they form in some different way where they formed really big to begin with and, and then some of them died and some of them got bigger? And we don't know. Um, and so that was really a, one of the motivations for, for building the James Webb Space Telescope to help us understand really our origin story. You know, how did we get here? How did that first galaxy form? Um, by, and James, the James Webb Space Telescope is designed to work in the infrared. So as I said before, the, the early universe galaxies, their light is redshifted into the infrared, and our, our telescopes that we had previously run out um, at about two microns. But JWST has now extended that wavelength range much, much further, um, up to um, 20 microns, um, and, or 25 microns, I think. So we can now look further and further back in time. Um, and so this is the James Webb Space Telescope in um, the clean room at NASA Goddard um, in Maryland in the US uh, a few years ago. Um, you can see how big it is compared to the tiny little people at the bottom. Um, so the full size of JWST is about the size of a tennis court. Um, the floor of it, and the mirror itself, which is the very shiny gold thing, is about eight meters across. Um, and it's not just gold because astronomers like shiny things, <laughs> um, but it turns out gold is really good at reflecting infrared light, um, so it had to be gold. Um, and um, you know, by, ref by detecting that infrared light, we can look further back in time, and it also enables us to see through that hydrogen fog. So as I said, JWST was launched um, in December 2021. Um, it then began a process of, of traveling out um, to its position where it now lives in a place called L2, which is behind the Earth in orbit around the sun. Um, and it's about one and a half million kilometers away from Earth. Um, so it was put there to basically try and keep it as cold as possible. So the infrared uh, detectors on James Webb 
uh, need to stay cold in order to stay sensitive to infrared radiation. Um, and so by putting it um, in this position, it, it has this uh, sun, giant sun shield, which it, use, which it has always facing away from the sun. So it's blocking out as much of the sun's light as possible to help it stay cold. Um, and I think uh, the sun shield itself, um, if you were to calculate the SPF factor of that sun shield, it's about one million. So there's some good sunscreen for you. Um, and yeah, now I can show you even more pretty pictures, basically. <laughs> so, so it took about two weeks for JWST to get to, to its position. And then a process of about six months um, of commissioning uh, at the beginning of last year, where all of the instruments were turned on and tested, et cetera. Um, and then we got the very first data uh, in July last year. So it was a pretty exciting moment. So I work at the, the Cosmic Dawn Center at MBI, where a, basically all of us are involved in some way in, in JWST. And so we all went to, to DTU to watch the first images being unveiled. And it was a really, really exciting moment. I mean, I've worked on JWST um, preparations of some kind for my whole career. Um, and so the very first image that we saw was this. I told you there were pretty pictures. <laughs> so this uh, was data that we got um, on the 11th of July. Um, I guess enough people thought it was cool that um, actually Joe Biden revealed this to the world um, <laughs> um, before NASA got around to it. So I'm not sure what that was about. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think he thought it was cool too. Um, and actually this image isn't necessarily much deeper than the Hubble ultra deep fields. Um, there's gonna be much, much more deep data taken by JWST in the coming uh, months and years. Um, but I think the amazing thing about this is that it's basically the same depth as that image that I showed you from Hubble, which I said was taken over more than between 10 and 20 days. JWST took this image in just a few hours. So yeah, it's like 100 times more powerful. So that means it can do things 100 times faster it can, or if, than, than Hubble could. Or if you did the same thing as you did with Hubble, it would be 100 times deeper. So you could see 100 times fainter galaxies. Um, and so this is really driving a revolution now in, in astrophysics. And I think we're only just getting started. Um, and I think in particular, um, for the astronomers, the, the mo actually the most exciting thing, more than just the the images is the fact that JWST has a high resolution spectrograph, um, which was actually um, the, which is called NearSpec, um, and the design of that was led by a Danish astronomer called Peter Jakobsen. And this high resolution spectrograph means that we can actually distinguish individual, uh, we can distinguish uh, emission lines coming from elements inside of these galaxies, gases of different elements inside these galaxies. So here what I'm showing you is a zoom in on one of the galaxies in the, the image that I just showed, um, which has been observed with this spectrograph, um, this little red blob. Um, but if you zoom, if you took all of the light from that galaxy and, and measured um, in high resolution, which is what you see here, that light, you can see all of these spikes. And these spikes come from these different gases inside this galaxy. So you can see this galaxy's got lots of oxygen, hydrogen, neon. I didn't know that galaxies had neon in them <laughs> before I saw a lot of these. I usually just think about hydrogen. Um, and the cool thing about this, I mean, is that this enables us to trace how uh, chemical elements evolved over the universe's history. Because apart from hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium, every other element in our universe was built in stars, was made in stars or the explosions of stars. Um, and so we should see as we go further back in time, and that's really the signature of the very first galaxy, is to find a galaxy that doesn't have oxygen or neon. It will only have hydrogen and helium. Um, and so this telescope enables us to do this. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes now talking about the things that I've been most excited by in the last... 10 months um, from these observations that I've been uh, more directly involved in. Um, and so the first comes from um, a project that I've been involved in called the GLASS Early Release, uh, Early Release uh, Science Survey, um, which was a program, a num one of a number of programs um, that was picked by NASA, I think now in 2017, so this has been something I've been waiting for for a long time, <laughs> um, to be some of the first... Uh, 
uh, first areas of the sky that JWST observed, some of the first observations that it made. So NASA's goal was to have in the first six months a set of observations made that would be public so anyone in the world could use them and basically to test out the different instruments, but could also answer specific science questions. And so we wrote a proposal in 2017 to use the telescope. We were going to use three of the four different instruments, test them out, um, and observe a particularly interesting patch of the sky um, to look for high redshift galaxies and use the spectrographs to measure their properties. Um, and the, the part of the, the program that I was involved in most was um, designing the observations that would give us these nice images that we could use to look for very, very distant galaxies. Um, and as part of that design process, um, I made some predictions from a theoretical model that I'd worked on of how many galaxies we expected to find, um, given what we knew about how we think galaxies were growing in the early universe. And so we predicted that we would, there would be about a 20% chance of finding one galaxy from the very early universe in this image. Uh, it turns out that I was very wrong. Um, and we actually found two galaxies in this image. Um, and so here I'm showing you, it was actually two different images um, because you get the, the camera has two segments. Um, and we found one in each. Um, so these Again, tiny little red dots <laughs> um, that we were, were detected in this image. Um, I should say, I do not get any of the credit for finding these things. These should all go to my collaborators in Rome, um, in particular Marco Castellano, who found, discovered these galaxies. Um, and so this has really been, I think, the biggest, for me, the biggest surprise of this early data. Um, and so this we actually discovered just within days of the first image that I showed you. We got, I think the first data came on the Monday and we got our data on the Thursday. Um, and then it was a kind of a crazy period where I think the papers were submitted on the following Monday or Tuesday. So some people were not sleeping very much. <laughs> um, it was very exciting. But this has really been a really big surprise because if we go back to this, um, this plot that I showed you a bit earlier of the, you know, the number of galaxies um, as a function of their brightness or size uh, going back in time, what we'd expected to see with JWST was something like this, that this kind of trend would continue. Um, but what JWST seems to be finding is something more like this, where we're actually finding just as many very, very bright galaxies in the early universe as we had found with Hubble at its limits. Um, and so this has really been a big puzzle, and I'll, I'll come back to that in just one second, because there's another puzzle which I think is related, which is something I'm also very excited about, um, which is a, actually a paper that my PhD student at MBI, um, Ting Yi Lu, just submitted uh, last week, um, which is that we've been trying to um, understand this bubbly um, early universe with the JWST observations. And we have some, I think, early indications that the bubbles that we can see with JWST, or we think we're seeing, um, are bigger than we had expected. And so these two things, I think, go hand in hand. We're seeing more bright galaxies than we'd expected and potentially bigger bubbles than we'd expected. And so the question is, why? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that yet. <laughs> but we have several hypotheses, um, and I think this is really going to be the focus of my research group in, in the next few years, is trying to test these hypotheses. So I think, you know, in particular, I'll just highlight um, these things that I think are most plausible. So we think that maybe these early universe galaxies are less dusty. So galaxies, so stars and the explosions of stars produce dust, um, which blocks a lot of the light coming from, from young stars, from, blocks the ultraviolet light. Um, and so we think that maybe in the early universe there hasn't been very much time to grow this dust. Um, and so that will mean that the galaxies could be brighter. Um, Another possibility is that stars in the early universe form in, in more um, rapid bursts, so kind of going off like fireworks. So you have a bunch of stars forming at once, and then it kind of chills out for a while, and then you have a bunch more stars forming. Um, and so that could make the galaxy appear much brighter than the galaxies in the later universe that might be forming more gradually. There may be something going on that means that stars can form more easily in the early universe. Um, I'm not sure why, but that is a possibility. Um, and it may also be that the stars themselves are in some way different, um, that potentially the stars are hotter and brighter than stars in the later universe. And this may be something we expect when we go to this very, very early stage 
and we don't have very many chemical elements other than hydrogen and helium, you may be able to make hotter, brighter stars. So as I said, we don't know yet, <laughs> um, but this is something that I'm really excited about working on now. Um, and so I'm just going to leave you with this final image of JWST it was, as it was um, after it was launched on its way um, out into space. Um, we're really excited about it because um, it's going to be working, we think, for at least 20 years, hopefully. Um, the, the, the launch was just right, so it's got enough fuel to last for 20 years. Um, and so it's a really exciting time to be working on this, um, and I'm really you know, grateful that I get to do that. Um, and so I just want to thank um, L'Oreal and uh, UNESCO again, thank everyone that I work with, um, and uh, thank you very much for listening.